Edward Buchanan, welcome to your In Fashion at Show studio. Thank you so much for coming in all the way from Milan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excited to be here. So you're kind of a fashion designer by trade, but you're also so many other things. You're a mentor, a consultant, fashion director in, Ma in Milan, for Perfect Magazine, professor. But I want to go right back to the beginning. When did fashion, as you understand it, first come into your life? What was your first kind of perception of fashion? My first perception of fashion, that was a long time ago, first of all. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was raised in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So uh, essentially I was, I was, you know, educated in the sticks, but um, I would have to say church ladies, you know, I was, I was raised in the church. Um, fashion or style was really related to what we did on Sundays at high noon. So um, the church ladies, the hats. Um, I come from a creative family. My mother is a pianist and um, I have a lot of musicians in my family. But I think at that age, living in, you know, Ohio, you kind of, you know, kind of soak in everything that's surrounding you. So, you know, I was a curious young kid, but I think, you know, church, family, those relationships really had a huge effect on, on kind of my creative process. Mm. So was that kind of, was creativity kind of, kind of um, fostered? Did you feel like it was supported when you were younger? I did. I, I, was, I was encouraged to be a creative. I, I, mm. I, I was drawing at a very, very, very young age, just, you know, scribbling. So it was cartoons. It was, um, um, it was, you know, Boy Scouts. It was, there were so many things that, that kind of la, led me to be a creative. I sang, you know, very early on. And in fact, I, 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 I always, almost thought I was going to be a musician somehow, but that never happened. But um, I sang, I played the French horn, I played the trumpet. Um, the creative process or being creative was absolutely encouraged in my family um, because many of them were creatives. Mm. And um, it was, it was a, a natural process. Um, it wasn't anything labored. I, I really always felt like I was, I was going to be somehow a creative. So when you then went on to kind of study at Columbus College of Art and Design and you did fashion illustration as well, was, was the idea of fashion there initially or was it about creating and kind of drawing and artistry? I, I didn't know what fashion design meant at that moment. <laughs> um, Ohio, at the Columbus College of Art and Design, it was a, a fantastic foundation. You know, I, I was going to Columbus College of Art and Design to be an artist, so I was studying fine art, um, art history, illustration, so the process as a, as a freshman was learning color concepts, you know, the Munsell color chart, you know, we were painting tempras, acrylics, you know, it was, um, it was a full scale kind of, you know, well-rounded education on, on art. And um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, fashion design, didn't even, I didn't really understand at that point what that meant. I, I didn't know that um, eventually I would go into design, but I did know that I was interested in style. And that was from a very early age, you know, um, whether it be from colors, whether it be from imagery, um, curiosity. I was really curious, you know, even into my teens, I was very curious. So um, it didn't really have a stamp on it until I think my junior year. Um, I, was, I was incredibly happy being a painter. I was, um, I was, I was a, a drawing all the time, you know, starting from cartoons figurative, um, it, it kind of started all to merge together when uh, I started going out to clubs, even in Columbus, Ohio. Um, so when I started to go out to clubs, it was really about music, it was really about discovery, um, it was kind of discovering my sexuality, um, and that led to um, going to bars where um, there was a lot of uh, design and art students that were there. So when you find yourself in creative spaces, you obviously start to understand more or less in terms of style or w the direction that's going to take you in. And that kind of helped. Um, maybe it was already there inside, you know. Um, but when I, when I began to be more curious about how people dressed themselves and how that related to, you know, the creative process, I think that's when I really discovered it was going to be fashion design. Mm. So you were at Columbus, and then yeah. was it straight after that that you went to Gap and you were a visual merchandiser? Yeah, well, it, I, I, I'd always had to work to pay for college. Um, I, although I was on scholarship, um, I had to work to pay for everything. So I was doing window dressing, and I started, um, 
I remember specifically my, my, my job that I wanted to have was at Benetton because I was just so inspired by those campaigns even at that time, you know, we're talking about in the 80s. So um, um, I went into Benetton and I got a job, at, a retail job selling clothing um, so that I can get free sweaters. Um, <laughs> and I started working there and while I was there I started doing window display. Window display in the Columbus uh, City Center it was called, I think it was, was a huge, huge mall. Um, met two mannequins, so I was dressing mannequins, so I thought that was like kind of the you know, the coolest thing to do. But, you know, the shift was from there to the gap, which became more visual merchandising based on the inside of the stores and the outside of the stores. So I was doing the window display, and as I was finishing school in, in Ohio, um, I thought to myself, wow, I want to go to New York. I didn't think I wanted to go to New York to go back to school. I just thought I wanted to go to New York to kind of be somehow in the center of everything that was happening. Um, at that point, I was more mature. I understood, you know, what fashion magazines were, what you know, what all of those things that started to kind of line up were. Um, but I got a transfer. After doing the, um, the, the windows at the Gap, I got a transfer to New York City, and that was like, the first job that actually brought me to New York. So essentially, I worked at the Gap for three months, then I decided that I wanted to go back into school. And Parsons School of Design was the thing that I chose because I wanted to go to a, a design school. Mm. Um, so once I arrived there, I applied with a portfolio. As I said, I was a great illustrator. I did some design sketches, but I had also my paintings and things from Columbus there. And um, I got accepted on, on scholarship to Parsons. I think that's really interesting actually talking about that foundation of so many different things you explored. You know, you've mentioned art history there, drawing, kind of really exploring lots of different kind of practices before you actually found fashion design as a path and decided to apply for that. Because I think it's interesting comparing that to today with fashion kids who hmm. kind of go straight into it and maybe don't have that kind of training. How important do you sure. think that training was to you and how your kind of life has progressed to have that kind of underpinning of, of that different kind of training practices? Well, I think that foundation in yeah. Ohio and then that middle phase, which was the d real, real design um, education, which I received mm. at Parsons. So once I, received, once I arrived at Parsons, I had gotten all of my college partying out of the way. Um, I got you know, the basics of what, it, what is art and what is cre the creative process out of the way. Um, when, I, when I decided that I was going to go into fashion design, it was really more about kind of the formal draping classes, it was mm. the sewing, you know, all of those fashion design things, as well as design, learning how design is. Um, so the foundation and what I, what I um, learned at both of those schools, I, I use every day. So it's, kind of, it's always kind of a trap to me to think about missing that mm. part, you know, that formative part of the formal education of design. Um, it, it's, um, I, oftentimes I can see it. <laughs> I can see it. I can <laughs> see it when the, the process is missed. Um, but, you know, the design process moves on and, and um, I think that for me as a creative, you know, I can speak first person, I think that um, I would be in a, be in a very different place mm. without having that formal education of design and fashion design. So when you moved to New York, how old were you around this point? <sighs> when I moved to New York, I was 20. Yeah. And is that your first time in New York? No, it wasn't. I, I had, you know, I had um, a good friend who was a graffiti artist that um, was living in New York. So uh, while I was in Columbus, we were going back and forth to New York just to kind of see. That's kind of when I fell in love with the city. You know, it was a okay. really beautiful time in New York. You know, the late 80s and early 90s was, was kind of, it was uh, th just this incredible hub of creativity and, and um, nightlife and, and uh, it, was, it was bizarre and it was loud and it was angry and it was beautiful. Um, it was, I think New York for me was, it's the only place still to this day where there's any nostalgia you know, really deep in my heart. It's the, it's the city that really formed me as an adult. And um, so, you know, that all led up to this kind of, you know, beautiful relationship that I had with New York. Because yes, it was school, I was, you know, I was getting my education, but the experience, the friends that I met, the, um, you know, everything, you know, it was really, you know, New York was like, it was an, an incredible, 
place. As hard as it was as well, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't making a lot of money in the beginning stages. I didn't come from, you know, a, 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 an extraordinarily wealthy family. So I really had to kind of work hard to kind of maintain. I had to work hard to eat. <laughs> I had to work hard to travel. I had to work hard to go out. So it was, um, <clears throat> I think those struggles and, and the energy that it really took to, to survive in that city mm. is also kind of stamped on my chest. And what were some of those kind of modes of survival, you know, what you know, you've spoken about? I mean, to work, to really support yourself in school, what kind of jobs were you doing outside of school? Well, I had to work full time, you know? So imagine that I was a full time student and I was working full time. So after I started at The Gap, I was only at The Gap for like maybe three months and I was in the window. And I remember this guy coming up and knocking on the window, and it was a recruiter from Giorgio Armani. They were opening these stores called Armani Exchange, which later became the AX that we know today. But um, they were opening stores, so they, they, they recruited me immediately. So I started working for Giorgio Armani. Um, this is in my second year. And so I, I continued working at Giorgio Armani as a visual display person. I was doing showrooms on the inside and the outside. Um, it was kind of a really cool clothing hookup at that time because, you know, in the 90s, Emporio Armani was like, the windows in Emporio Armani on Fifth Avenue um, were, were the most incredible creative things, you know. The windows at that time um, were like storytelling, you know. It's what dro drove the consumer to come on the inside. So the story that you were telling in the windows and the budgets were enormous. So we were, you know, we were creating airplanes in the windows and, you know, we were doing all kinds of, you know, the, the, there was no limit really, you know, in budget to what we could do in those windows. So, um, but at the same time, show and prove, I had to work full time and I had to go to school full time. So there was a lot of late nights. Um, there were really beautiful and incredible relationships that I made in school, outside of school. Um, it, New York, you know, the first time, I, rem I remember the first, specifically the first time I went to New York, I still have the Polaroid. I was walking down the street with my friend James and I always had a Polaroid camera with me and um, I, I was taking pictures while I went down the street, and I didn't even realize it, but later on I saw that the picture was Keith Haring and his boyfriend um, be before he passed away. And um, so it's just kind of those kind of moments, you know, that you reflect on, or that I reflect on in that time, that it was a magical moment for me. So you're in New York having this kind of amazing time, kind of experiencing a lot of things for the first time, and then you graduate, and in 1995, um, you joined Bottega Veneta. How yeah. did that all come about? So you go from <laughs> New York to then moving to Italy, but how, how did that first come about? How were you approached? It was super abstract. You know, when, when I think about that experience, it was, you know, you know when you're young and, and, you know, you have your eyes set in that moment on something, I was, you know, my, my mind was clearly in another place. I was thinking, or Helmut Lang, or Andy Miller Meester. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't Bottega Veneta. Bottega Veneta at the time was, you know, these woven handbags that we thought, you know, old ladies carried. You know, was it really wasn't the brand that you know you were kind of sucked into as a young creative. But I tell you that <clears throat> this is how the connections work. My friend, very close friend, Rodney Patterson, was doing window display. We had a real kind of channel and. and the, the visual display and visual merchandising people were really connected, so we knew what everyone else was doing um, in terms of their gigs and what they were doing. And he was working at Bottega Veneta doing the windows on Madison Avenue. So that, that was the first store, the Bottega Veneta store was on Madison Avenue. Um, and he told me they were looking for a ready-to-wear designer. So I was finishing school. Um, I had done internships. Um, I did an internship at Michael Kors. I was doing Gap internships. So. Um, I, was, I was drawing a lot. I was drawing for Donna Karen, so I was doing a lot of illustration. But I didn't really have any hardcore kind of or luxury experience, none at all. I didn't have any 7th Avenue experience. Um, he told me they were looking for a ready-to-wear designer. Um, and I was like, okay. So I kind of went into the store, and I remember specifically going into the Madison Avenue store, and kind of the shelves were a little bit broken down. It was decrepit, and I was like, what the hell am I going to do here? It was like... I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to work it out because I need a job and I need to make some money. So um, I put together this kind of portfolio of um, a capsule collection. And I, I approached it at first thinking, what could be the accessory to the accessories? So I created this kind of capsule of knitwear and uh, leather goods, meaning jackets and things that were um, actually kind of there to kind of prop up the accessories were the breadwinners at the time. 
and it was uh, well researched and, and I was extremely creative and, and, um, and I met with the owner. Um, he kind of connected it. I met with the owner on Madison Avenue, Lauro Motedo um, and Vittorio Motedo were the owners of the company at the time. This is before Gucci Group, so it was a family owned business still. Um, and, but I sat down with Lauda and we just kind of connected, you know, we kind of really spoke the same language and, and even if I didn't know how to make what I had just presented to her, um, she somehow was convinced and, you know, to kind of preface the situation, there had never been ready to wear, you know, I was essentially, you know, 20 something years old, um, not understanding what the hell was going on. And I was hired to create a, a ready-to-wear collection for Bottega Veneta. So I got the job, and then I was flying off to Vicenza, not even Milan. I was flying to Vicenza, which is kind of in close to Venice, um, hired to design this collection. I, there was no way in the world that I could even imagine what that would mean. I, thought, I just thought, OK, this is going to be a job, so I got to kind of show up mm -hmm. and figure this out. You know, It was kind of like trial and error. Um, and uh, it was a fucking scary ass time, you know. It was um, the real experience. I think when I when I arrived for the first time, this is kind of a 360 moment. This is what kind of informed, I guess, my entire experience in Italy because I arrived at the airport in Venice, and I had long dreadlocks and I probably had a sweatshirt and, and jeans on, and the police stopped me immediately when I went through to check my passport, and. Um, they were convinced that I had drugs. They were like, just give us the drugs. And I was like, well, um, I don't have drugs. I don't, I don't even smoke. Uh, at that time, I didn't even smoke cigarettes. Um, so they took me back. They, they, they made me strip down, and they cavity searched me. Um, they held me for hours. I had to actually had to contact someone from Bottega Veneta to come and get me out of um, the, um, the airport. Um, released, and I was like, there's something here that's not like it was before. And it was a, it was a real eye-opening experience. And it, it kind of, um, I think it set me up somehow, mentally speaking, of what my relationship with a foreign country, you know, as a, an African-American male might be. Do you think there was a certain, both in the approach to kind of taking on this, this big job and also the kind of cultural and political differences in Italy, there was a certain kind of naivety that we have in youth which which was probably a blessing maybe a blessing in disguise because it threw you into these situations <laughs> well you know we were a team in, in the beginning stages you know I, I was holding the pins there was a, a a woman named Manuela Maureen who was doing shoes Eduardo Wong Valle was doing um, handbags John Concagno was the art director there was this team of, of people two of us being American and so what I did was you know I kind of had a really you know, connect with, you know, what, what the energy was in this office because I had no idea what the fuck I was doing, you know? I was like, I can draw, I like fashion, you know, we're gonna somehow make this happen. So psychologically, um, I didn't have any time to really be afraid. I had to kind of like get in there, sketch what I thought would be appropriate for a brand that I really had no somehow relationship with and kind of make it happen. So I, I really started from what I knew, and that was kind of American sportswear. And, and I, I wanted it to be, you know, casual and cool and easy, um, and at the same time, respect, you know, what the history of the brand was. You know, at that time, the advertising campaigns were when your own initials are enough. So I knew that it, it needed to be about discretion. Um, it needed to be about luxury. Um, I had to really discover and understand what luxury actually meant at that time, you know? Was it in the make? Was it what it looked like on the outside? Was it who wore it? You know, there were all these questions that I had. So I just started to kind of like do these kind of like chocolate brown, beautiful things. And it kind of like slowly, step by step, it was like, you know, everyone was throwing daggers at me, you know? I, did, I, I, was, I had no idea what the hell was going on. But you know, in those years, you know, in the, in the early 90s, we were making toiles and crocodile, you know? The budgets were enormous, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky that they gave me the opportunity and the time to actually learn, because essentially it was my school in luxury goods. So, you know, when I walked into that factory and all the time <clears throat> that I spent in that factory um, was kind of like 
you know, my third university, you know, I was really learning about make, that there were no ready-to-wear factories. So the first factory that I went to, I went to Milan and I found a knitwear factory. Why a knitwear factory? I have no idea. It, it was kind of, I was like, the first thing in my head is like, okay, well, with leather, what do you want to wear? You want to wear sweaters. You want to wear, you know, a cool cashmere hoodie sweater. You want to wear a sweatpant. You know, these were all things that didn't exist in the, you know, context of what Bottega was as a company, you know? They, they had woven eggs or, you know, it was always like soft, 70, pliable, Nappa, beautiful um, handbag. But I kind of had to make that in the clothing. So at first, you know, the approach was American sportswear mixed with Italian leather goods. And it started to kind of work, you know? We kind of built this thing up slowly into our first ready-to-wear show, which was in, in uh, no, the actual first presentation was in Milan. The first ready-to-wear show was in, um, in Milano in Palazzo Serbelloni, and um, it was, for me, I really understood somehow everything after that because I approached it. We only had, I think, two, le- two woven bags in the show. Everything was really spared down. It was that moment, you know, of this kind of minimalist, you know, it was beautiful leather and cotton. It was a spring-summer show. and. Um, a lot of people loved it, a lot of people hated it, um, but it, it, it informed really, in a way, what I needed to do in order to move forward in the future. And, and um, yeah, every step of the way was a learning process. And, and um, I had, you know, I was at the helm of a, a major Italian company in order to kind of, you know, allow me and educate me along the way. I think it's interesting as well because that idea of the design director, really you were doing what everyone knows today as the creative director, (laughs) really, weren't you? Yeah. And kind of, but also doing it from the ground up because as you say, it was just, just kind of accessories brand at that point. Sure. Um, So when you joined as design director, did you have, because there wasn't kind of a, was there a design team there waiting to work with you or did you have to build out a team? How did that work? There was a there was a design team for accessories. Yeah. You know, there were there were, you know, hands on accessories, but there wasn't a design yeah. team for apparel. I had to build everything for apparel. I had to find all the factories, I had to find my assistants. Um, it was all from scratch. And you know, I think when I look back at that time, especially in the beginning, beginning stages, where you are saying that that was really the position of a creative director as opposed to what a design director was. Um, I didn't know what the difference of that was. Mm. I was just working. Um, I didn't know what the difference was of that was, but I learned later and, ref- and reflected a lot on why was it that I didn't have that title. There were many, many around me that had that title. Why was it that I didn't have that title? Why was it that they wouldn't have considered me the creative director of this company? I was in a space where surrounding me, there were not many others that looked like me. Black designers at the, he- at the head of, of a house, helming a luxury house in Italy, wasn't there. There were people, some people that I knew that were working in the interior structures of companies. Lauren Steele was there. Um, Warren Davis was at Jill Sander. You know, I knew there was a community of, of black and brown people that were working within the company, but it hadn't happened. And um, Eric Wright was around. He was still working for Lagerfeld. I knew he was working at Trusardi. Um, but at the helm, as a creative director or even as a design director, there was no one else. Were they afraid? Um, there was absolutely, within the Italian space, that still that internal racism that we, we have to talk about today and experience today. So it was kind of, yes, you're doing that job, but um, maybe we're not ready to give you the title of what that job means. And how do you think that feeds into what I think has been a great disservice to your period at Bottega, that often it's lesser spoken about than kind of the Mayer era and, and kind of everyone leading up to kind of Daniel Lee in the recent years. Um, how do you kind of feel about that? Do you feel over, overlooked? Um, well, it happened actually, where there was a story written um, about, um, it was a a newspaper story that was written about the the history of Bottega Veneta. 
and um, that meant the story from the beginning, from uh, where, where it started, how it started, what built it, and then every creative director up until, um, I think it was up until Daniel when that actually came out. And I read the story, and they, re they wrote me out of the story. I wasn't there. And at first I was like, oh, here we go again. You know, I'm, I'm so tired of chasing this conversation or, or, or trying to force myself into mm. Um, a story that I was physically a part of. <laughs> There's no bargaining, I was there and I did that job. Um, and then I said, no, fuck it. I'm gonna contact the writer and I'm gonna contact who I know very well, her editor, who probably um, commissioned this project. And I did, and I wrote to them and I said, listen, um, this is very interesting, you know? Um, I think maybe that if you're a journalist, you have to report. Um, and that means not skipping over certain portions of the story. Um, because when I read this, I see that you haven't actually done the research in the story. Um, and all of a sudden, when you point that out to them, they're shocked. Oh, I'm so sorry. We, we didn't do the proper I'm, I'm the apologetic pouring out of them. And it's kind of like, well, why don't you actually do the research beforehand and then you won't have to be approached about things like that. So this has happened several times. They corrected it, they amended it, they apologized. But, you know, I, 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 I think that I am, um, after so many years of, of being always in that position where I have to recount and remind people um, of the things that I've done is, it, it becomes exhausting. In this space, it becomes exhausting. Mm. I want to move on in a bit to talking about the kind of work that you have done in that space for designers mm. working in Italy. But first I want to talk about the years kind of following Bottega Veneta when um, you launched firstly your first own brand, La Flesh, you co-founded in 2001, yeah. and then later San Savino 6. Um, First, I want to ask, what, does, what have you found that having your own brand and not being at a heritage house, what, does that, what have you found that that offers you um, and why, why you've continued to be in that space and haven't really felt like you've wanted to, to depart that and go back to a house? Well, the shift from, from Bottega Veneta to Le Flesh was kind of a natural shift. You know, I'd been there for, what, six and a half years, so it was a long time. And, and me and Manuela Maureen, who was the, the shoe and accessories designer, decided that we wanted to start this company, but we wanted it to be completely unrelated to anything that had a history. You know, with Bottega Veneta, we had to respect the history. Even if we were attempting to move forward, actually moving forward, we had to really respect a consumer that existed and um, by, while at the same time offering them an option for what might be the future consumer. You know, we always had to kind of remember it's here. Whereas with La Flesh, when we started La Flesh, there was no history. Um, we had the luxury experience, um, we had the design know-how. Um, we were really naive in, in, in those years of not knowing what it actually took. You know, we, we, we hear you, we, we're coming from, as I said, you know, making, you know, samples in, in the most luxurious materials to um, considering that we still should be doing that with our own money, but then all of a sudden running out of money. So it was that those years, those formative years of, of launching this brand and, and not knowing really what it was, but it was like extreme creativity. You know, I think the flesh for us was, was the anti, in a way, Bottega Veneta, but at the same time it was the Bottega Veneta. Because I say anti in a way because we didn't want to be that you know, because that's what we did and that's what we were coming from. We wanted to be kind of in our own way punk, you know, so we, you know, I was designing the clothing, she was designing the accessories, there were no rules, we were using the best materials, but it was like, it, it didn't have, you know, we, we started the first collection with only sweaters on top, bags and shoes, there were no pants, there were no skirts, you know, it was just kind of like, you know, it was kind of like building this kind of world you know, I remember Angela Flacavento saying it was like kind of Victorian hip hop, you know, because we we're both Americans, but we kind of had been, you know, formed within the, you know, within the, the, the historic story of, of luxury goods in Italy. So we had that under our belt. So the mixture of those two things was like kind of really, um, really interesting. And it, and it had very high highs, you know, we, we, 
it was a, a time when, when I think kind of it seemed anything was possible. We had no money, but we were doing shows in Paris, you know, we, we were doing shows in Milan, you know, celebrities were contacting us and, and we were, you know, it was a, um, I think that was a, I felt like within my story that, that that part of time in Milan specifically, creativity seemed to be at, a, at an all time high. You know, we didn't have um, mm, that interesting pressure of people saying, oh my God, you have to do this and you have to sell this and, and this has to be the, you know, the formal commercial part of the collection. We didn't have those kind of like, you know, voices in our ears. So it was, it was experimental, it was, it was um, rebellious, but at the same time it was, it was honest. And, and that, I think, really um, sunk into how I really thought that I would continue designing and be a designer based on those years. It informed what would happen after that. Without those kind of voices in your ear telling you what you should do, who you should dress, you mentioned there kind of celebrities asking to wear the clothes. Who were you guys dressing and how did you, without having those pressures, how did you decide who you wanted to dress? What kind of people did you want to see in your clothes? Well, we didn't really decide. They kind of decided themselves because we were, you know, at that time we were working with a lot of magazines. They were, it was the, the editorial um, um, kind of like shift and swing was like at, at high, you know, you know from, from America to Europe, you know. So by being, um, let's say shown in these magazines like you know whether there was ID or you know it didn't, didn't matter what it was the celebrities would actually see the product through or word of mouth or someone else wearing it or in a magazine and they would contact us so it wasn't a time really you know there were celebrity stylists um, that were working with celebrities what it wasn't like it is today you know it was like the stylist got contacted by maybe this person and you know we were working with you know Cher contacted us how the fuck do you contact Cher, you know? <laughs> and it was just the most bizarre thing because we were doing these leather harnesses that were kind of studded with these beautiful kind of bronze studs and it was like kind of like a, a chastity belt almost. And, um, and here we have Cher with the chastity belt on, you know, in concert, you know, wearing the flesh. We were working with the Rolling Stones. Um, we were working with Jennifer Lopez. It was very abstract, you know? It was, it was um, uh, Lauren Hill, you know? All of these people were contacting us through different venues, you know? Um, I remember working a lot with Vibe Magazine um, in New York at the time. A lot of the, the, um, the hip hop artists were contacting us for things. So it was a, it was a crazy time and, and it felt so natural, you know? We didn't, have a pr we didn't feel pressured to be, um, let's say the, the, the fashion dolls of, of Milan, you know, it wasn't really about that, you know, it wasn't about our name being at the top of any kind of mask head. We were just kind of like working and enjoying it, losing an awful lot of money, an awful lot of money. We were poor. <laughs> we spent it all. We spent it all on Cervo and beautiful leathers and cashmere. And um, yeah, it was, it was, um, we needed that release. I needed that release. I personally needed that release. After Bottega Veneta, I needed that time to kind of like, you know, discover and go somewhere else, you know? That was also the time where I started consulting. So I, I started working for different brands. Um, and that's when I really discovered that, you know, I am a knitwear designer. <laughs> that's what I do, so. I mean, you say, you know, that's when you really discovered that you were a knitwear designer. <laughs> and it's interesting kind of talking to you and hearing you know, that when you went to Bottega, you had all these interactions with the factories and the craftsmanship, and that seems to then become this common thread, which is about, I know that with San Savino, you have a very close, I mean, it's named after the factory, Yeah. Um, that you have this close relationship with the factory. Can you talk a bit about launching San Savino and that relationship that is so important to you with you and the craft and the factories? Sure. It, it, the, the design process and making garments for me, making clothing for me, um, has always started from the beginning from the inside out. So it was always about craftsmanship for me. It was always about make, it was always about hand. How does it feel on the body? Um, I, I, I've, I've never been a dictator. I never wanted to kind of say, you have to wear this like this, you know? It was, 
It was always about kind of crafting for me in my head these kind of beautifully articulate things. And it was very Bauhaus in the way that I wanted to kind of build these things up really strong and hard and, and beautiful so that you could have them, you know, for, for ages after. So my connection to the factory was an exchange. What I brought to the factory in terms of design and know-how and taste, we always have to consider taste and, and, um, and creativity, they gave me in exchange the understanding of actually how the process is and actually to make these things. So it was really a, a slow process in building. I think even at Bottega, you know, even when we started working with the stylist, you know, Katie Graham was our first stylist that we, we worked with at, at Bottega, but me, I, I, I was always interested in like being inside of the factory, you know, it was like we kind of, you know, met those two, two um, uh, kind of spaces, but I really always was just interested in the make and, and with the flesh it was about that and, and with what I'm doing now it's about that. It just never ends. I'm, I'm, I am, um, I don't know, I think I, it's like building blocks for me, you know, I kind of have an idea in my head of what I think it, I want it to be like in the end and I just kind of like start to piece it together. I love, there's a story that I've read kind of reading up for this interview where you, you said that when you started San Savino, you sent some of your friends an email and asked them each to tell, tell you what was their kind of one favorite or essential piece of clothing. And I feel that that kind of comes back to that idea of, of building blocks. Yeah. I wonder, do you think you're quite a pragmatic person in both? I, I think I'm very pragmatic. And, and that was really about how local design is for me and, and how I, my, my intention is always for the individual or the consumer or, or the friend is going to use actually the thing that I'm creating. You know, I love fantasy and I love uh, drama and I love, you know, being eccentric, um, but I really want something that's useful. So when I started San Silvino 6, I, I, I sent out this email to close friends, um, some were architects, some were lawyers, some were fashion designers, some were stylists, some were makeup artists. And, and it was essentially asking them, what do you have that's in your wardrobe that you covet? And what don't you have in your wardrobe that um, you feel like you missed? So it was a very simple question in a way. But I really wanted to get an understanding of like, what are these kind of like building blocks to, that exist in a wardrobe? And, it, and, it, and I got so many things back, you know, and it was the beginning stages of, of how I kind of envisioned what Sense of 6 might be because I wanted to interpret those perfect things that existed on the interior structures of anyone's wardrobe. So whether it was the perfect white shirt, um, how could I translate that in fully fashion knitwear? It was understanding how can you get like the crispiness of poplin, um, but actually the piece be knitted or denim, I got a lot of jeans, how can you kind of discover, you know, which was a long process for me developing knitted, de knitted denim, because I wanted it to look exactly like jeans, um, I wanted it to feel like jeans when you had it on the body, but at the same time I wanted you to be completely mobile and comfortable and move, so, you know, these are all things that, that I kind of put in the blender and said, okay, let's start developing these things, and it ended up being you know, the first collection, the perfect kind of parka, the perfect white shirt, the perfect jean, the perfect t-shirt, the perfect bomber. So it was all of these kind of things that we all have that exist in our wardrobes, but I really interpreted them in knitwear. And it was kind of also about requiring kind of a second look, because when you look at it, it looks like jeans. You're not convinced at all that it's not jeans, but then when you have it on the body or when you touch it or when you look on the inside, it gives you a completely different effect. What is it about knitwear specifically that you love so much and that has become kind of such a focus of craft for you? You know, it, incidentally, it just became my medium. I think, when I really think about it, because I'm, you know, I'm asked this, asked this question all the time, and I, and I think it has a lot to do with me and my relationship with comfort and ease and not ever having the perfect body, um, wanting to be able to put things on myself that, um, that kind of, or masked, or, or gave me the ease or the, the, the mobility that I wanted to be in a city. And I wanted to 
to create kind of these things that others could kind of feel the same way. But at the same time, um, it's a very technical, one of the most technical, let's say, sectors within the fashion design world because everything starts from a, a yarn. So I found that really intriguing because at, this, in, at the end of the day, most people think that you know, knitwear is just a sweater. On the contrary, it can be anything. Um, we can create anything with knitwear. It can be hard, it can be soft, it can be languid, it can be fluffy, you know, it can look like fur, it can look like denim, it can do anything, you know, it can be lace. There's so many possibilities and I found that, you know, as beautiful and, and intricate as, as pattern cutting and making patterns, I just found, you know, that knitwear and especially in those beginning stages from creating things by hand into machine, it became so technical because everything now is, is programmed, you can kind of really do anything with it. So it was just, it was kind of probably love kind of set into my heart at the early stage, but then became my real, my real passion. I want to go back to talking about another passion, which is kind of music, yeah. um, dance as well. Um, both for La Flesha and San Savino, you've done presentations kind of presented in dance studios or with dance format. Um, so it's fair that kind of your own kind of clubbing life and dance and the music of your childhood as well has had kind of a lasting impact. Um, can you tell me about kind of those clubbing days both in New York, but also in Milan, those kind of early days in Italy. Sure. Yeah, music is, I don't know, I can't imagine existing without music and the love, my love for music. And it, and it relates to, yes, my creative process. I, I grew up in music, you know? I mean, I, my, when I was young, you know, at the same time that as we were listening to Stevie Wonder and, and Elton John, we were listening to um, the Fleetwood Mac, you know, so it was, a, it was just kind of, kind of this kind of cross-cultural kind of mix of all of these different things. And, and so it always was a part of my process, you know, when I'm designing, what I'm listening to, how I'm feeling, um, what is it saying to me? So I never knew the creative process without music being related to it. So I think when I started to create Sense of Uno 6, um, it was really about community, and the community me, t for me meant people that were close to me. Um, Deborah Shaw was my, my muse from when I was at Columbus College of Art and Design. If you look at my early illustrations, they were Deborah Shaw. I had never met Deborah Shaw, but Deborah Shaw was just this figure that I thought, okay, this is the, you know, this is the, the, the woman that I kind of envisioned this happening to. And here we have later on that we became, you know, incredibly, intimate and beautiful friends and and um she's been there from the beginning for me you know in the beginning of the process so she's someone that i continually am inspired by that i collaborate with dance is the same way it was always related to people that are surrounding me i was um i was always going to see the frankfurt ballet in in uh in germany and um one of the principal dancers stephen galloway um, we met in Amsterdam many years ago through a, a common friend. He became a close friend that we essentially met in the club. We became close friends and we became really um, aligned collaborators. And, and when I work with people that are around me, I can, I can avoid being, I can avoid the fear that sometimes is, it happens when you surround yourself with people that, that don't know you. Um, not conflict, because there's also conflict there, because you know, it's not all perfect from them to me in exchange, but um, we trust each other and we love each other, so you know, even when we argue or even when we disagree, there's still, it's still harmonious. So Stephen was this, this incredible dancer that became the, the creative director of, of all of my presentations. And dance made perfect sense with knitwear. It made perfect sense with, you know, something which was languid and something which was, was, was able to travel. You know, all of these things kind of made sense together. You know, um, I work with a lot of dancers. Uh, MJ Harper, Maquette, they were all, you know, people that surrounded me between Berlin, between Milan, between America. So it was kind of this, it just became this kind of harmonious um, process, which I think incidentally, is my way. I like working with people that I respect their art and uh, also that I know.
your process is seem your approach kind of knowing you and hearing you talk is is very generous and also very much a peop about the people around you um, you've previously kind of called yourself the kind of designers designer as well would you say you're not really interested in being kind of the star of the show and actually just working behind the scenes I think I am I've always been a quiet kind of working on it on my own mm. in my head um, type of person and I find that, I, that I'm I'm a an, an kind of more of an intimate creative and um, I've never been interested in possibly what that noise means when you <laughs> yeah. you you have to be that I was never interested in being that I was always interested in being involved in, in great projects that I was inspired by. And if it so happens that other people found those things equally as interesting as, as my process in actually creating them, then I was perfectly happy with that. Um, I don't have to be the headline. I've never dreamed of being the headline. Um, I've dreamed of opportunity that um, I've not always had. I've dreamed of, of many other things, but I've never dreamed of being the one, mm. you know, I'm, I've, I've, my process, my creative process is, is honest and it's also humble for me, I think, and I'm, I'm fine with that. Mm. I mean, I think you are the one to many people um, and I want to talk about, a bit about the mentorship that you do, but how have you found, you've been working with Perfect Magazine and Katie Grand, a long time kind of collaborator and friend of yours. Um, and going to the shows, how have you found kind of being in front of the curtain, if you will, and being an observer of everything? Yeah, well, you know, Perfect Magazine happened again, like, like you know, uh, the conversations that we've been having here today is that, you know, I've known Katie Graham for 25 years almost, and, um, you know, at a certain point, I think we were in Ibiza, and she said, Edward, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop referring you to other people and I'm, I want you to work with me. And I was like, I've never worked for a magazine before. I'm, I've been an editor all my life, my entire life, but I've never worked within the editorial process of what it means to actually create a magazine. But, you know, I was like, why not? You know, it's kind of like the left and the right side of what I do. And it's, it's been a beautiful process because it's, um, you know, I can write, I can style, you know, um, I still can design. It's kind of a, you know, like a, a curveball that, that's still a part of my creative process is kind of informed by the work that I'm doing there. So they kind of run, you know, hand in hand. Um, going to shows was very difficult for me in the beginning. Very difficult because I think that um, I'm used to being backstage. You know, I'm really used to kind of the process of building it and then it happens and then, um, it's, um, mm, it's interesting um, because it gives you a completely different perspective being on the outside because you're seeing the final product. You're seeing the, seeing the final project of whatever, mm. what, what, what was being built. But um, it's, again, another thing because I, I have the possibility and luck to actually do them both. I want to finish by talking a bit about Italy and your home mm. in Milan, where you, where you now call home. Um, so you moved back to New York for a short period after leaving Bottega, you worked with JLo, you worked with Diddy on their brands, then you came back to Milan and it's kind of been your home ever since. Um, what, what is it about kind of Italy and Milan and the industry there that's, that's kept you there and that's felt like an anchor? Italy is, is home. I became an adult in Italy, you know. I, I always say I was born in Ohio, you know. I. I I became a, an adult in New York City and I became a professional in Milan. So that was kind of the process. Mi Milano is, um, it's a yin yang. Um, it, I struggle with Milan. I struggle with still every day um, being reminded that I'm a black man living in Milan. Um, I, I, I love my process. I love my close friends that I have there. Um, it's. I just can't imagine where else I would be, where, where I would go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not afraid of the idea of possibly moving somewhere else or, or going somewhere else, um, but I'm really, really comfortable being there. And, you know, I, I also think that really right now, in this moment, in this very moment, 
what I intend on doing is being in the space that I'm comfortable with, that I love, and kind of passing off. I'm, I've arrived at that stage where I really want that exchange. I really want to be able to take and kind of formulate everything that I've done and everything that I've experienced and be able to kind of communicate and pass that through to other creatives that look like me. You know, they don't always have that space really where they can um, feel like they see a reflection um, of themselves and someone that's actually working within the system. So um, I think I really wanna, wanna build that into the future. Because mm. you were co-founder of um, We Are Made in Italy, which launched in 2020, WAMI. Um, can you talk, for people that don't know a bit, about what the main message of WAMI is and how their work is, what they kind of do, especially in the context of where the industry in Italy is right now? Sure. What WAMI started because it was necessary that someone did it. And, and WAMI is an in, in, in acronym for We Are Made in Italy. So essentially what we're saying is that we are too, are also made in Italy. Um, it is a system which has built and ed been educated on you know, the idea of systemic racism like any other. We know that um, we are not alone within the community. We know that there are others that look like us in the community. Um, and we also know that they don't get the same opportunity as others rather than us in the community. So I couldn't continue working within this industry knowing that these problems existed and complaining about them without actively trying to do something to change it. So those complaints kind of turned into organization and structure. We, we put together an organization with um, Stella Jean, who's also a uh, designer and creative director, and Michel Ngomo, who's the founder of Afro Fashion Association. And we, we kind of collectively put together a, a cultural reform. And this cultural reform for us, just in, in you know, within the space, is to actually start to build and, and, and educate um, at young Afro-Italians and, and young black and brown kids that want to be creative, don't know how to find themselves in the space, we, 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 we attempt to get them um, uh, educational grants, you know. It's really a system that's set up to kind of like feed the talent into the system. Because I think, you know, young kids today, they look around them and they say, why can't I be that? Why can't I do that? And they often talk about this seat at the table, you know. We want the seat at the table. I don't want the seat at the table. You know, we want to make our own table, I'm, you know, by, by by accepting this seat at the table, you're saying that you know, you're okay with them just giving you what they want when they want it. If we kind of build structurally this community and we create these things ourselves, um, for the future it's gonna be much stronger because our names are gonna be on the door and we can invite others in. So you've done this work to advocate both for yourself and for others in the industry. Now we're in 2023, do you feel like the industry is advocating for you? Do you feel like that is coming back or not? <laughs> yes and no. I feel still that I have to battle every day. Um, I feel still that um, opportunity for me and others that are qualified like me that are black or brown um, still don't have the same opportunities presented to them. Um, but at this point, I can't labor over the idea um, that I'm not being presented with opportunity. I have to create the opportunity on my own. Um, they're really, I mean, within the course of my career and in, in, in all the years that I've worked in fashion, you know, I've had some incredible allies, you know, I mean, you know, I was introduced to Virgil Oblo from Marcelo Berlone. Marcelo Berlone is my, my, my friend, you know, my dear friend, and he's always been there. And, you know, Stefano Pilati, and, you know, so, I, you know, what, what's important, that I think, now, from now, going forward, is, yes, we build it up strong on the inside within the community, but it's really, really important, those allies on the outside. They really, really are important because it's not us telling them what they have to do, it's them understanding on their own actually what they can do 
to actually make the face of what we do here change for the future. So without them, we just continue to go on in this separate kind of space where all of a sudden we find ourselves after the pandemic where everyone's checking off these boxes. They're saying, oh yes, you know, diversity and inclusivity, we have to do this. We check off the black box, uh, you know, we maybe hire a few creative directors that fit the bill. Um, is it really honest? Question mark. Or is it just because the conversation has been happening? It's, um, I question whether it's, it's always honest. Um, and I'm not saying that those individuals, if they were selected, were not talented and capable to, capable to do the job, but I think we have to question the system as a whole and why this happens. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Edward, for sharing your life in fashion with us. Um, thank you for joining us at Show Studio. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much.